thrilled to hand it over to Austin and Merlinda, um, who are going to talk about their experience at Zendesk around conversation design, the skill sets needed to support it, and their experiences with building and resourcing bot and CS, CX automation teams. Um, we're going to hold questions till the end, although you are always welcome to put things in the chat. Um, we should have about um, 15 minutes maybe at the end for Q&A. So with that, I'll hand it off. Thanks, everybody. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Austin Lacey from Zendesk here. I'm the uh, manager of the chatbot AI and automation team, and I have my team member Marlinda with me. Um, so we'll be given the presentation today. Very excited to be here to talk about uh, our experience with conversation design and building up our team here at Zendesk that manages our bot and our different automations that we have in play today. Um, so we can go to the next slide here. Um, so just a quick agenda for kind of what we're going to be covering today. Um, we'll do a quick introduction into conversation design since that may be new for some people. It's a little bit different than necessarily, you know, knowledge base writing and kind of how that all plays out. Types of bots that are available in the industry today. We'll go into standing up a bot and automation team from the ground up. Talk about bot personas and why that's important. Choosing a bot tool and then maintenance and continuous improvement strategies for the team. Um, so we got a lot of content to cover. We are going to try to leave, like, uh, like Kelly said, some time at the end for questions. So please put those in the chat and we'll definitely kind of keep monitoring that throughout. And if there's a lot of questions, we might, you know, end a little bit early so we can cover all those because I think there might be some really good discussion here. Um, so with that next slide, like I said, Austin Lacey here, and then I'll let um, Marlinda introduce herself quick. Hi, everybody. I'm Marlinda Galapon, a conversation designer since 2015. Previously, I was at uh, companies like Yahoo, Adobe, Salesforce, and now I'm at Zendesk working with Austin. Yeah, and we have, just for context for everybody, uh, we have um, four conversation designers and um, a couple automation specialists on my team. So we have a really robust team of individuals, and we're very, very lucky how Zenda supports our, our team and gives us the resources to do this. So um, definitely excited to dive into more of this. So we can go to the next slide. And so I'll hand this over to Merlinda to give a quick introduction on conversation design. Thank you. Um, uh, the first thing I think everyone should know about designing conversations for chatbots, if you can go to the next slide, please, is that how easy it is to, to really mess up. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen recent news now that chat GPC and LMs have become such a big thing. These are now making headlines. Chatbots are hallucinating. I will say that no one ever on, on the building side of it intentionally tries to build a bad and poor chatbot conversation design. I know about the Air Canada one. This actually happened in November 2022 before ChatGPT was released, which means that this was um, a human writing something that didn't confirm Air Canada's policies. And so there was a discrepancy between the chatbot dialogue and what was written on the website. So that was not a hallucination. I just kind of want to put it out there. But when you're not careful and intentional about how you create conversation repair, um, oversetting expectations, and poor trouble handling, it just leads to a poor experience, which, next slide, please, which, of course, everyone knows leads to um, lower CSAT, higher um, average handling times for your agents, and higher operational costs. Um, it leaves your customers feeling frustrated, alienated, and overwhelmed, especially when we talk about voice. Right now, I've um, really just been talking about chat, but in voice, if it doesn't understand your accent, or maybe it doesn't understand the way that you phrase a, for non-English um, um, speakers, uh, non-native English speakers, if they phrase their English sentence in a way that wasn't trained because it's not the standard way of speaking English, then it'll it'll hand over the chatbot to, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. And how frustrating is that for your customers for now? Um, next slide, please. But okay, so what is conversation design? Isn't it just writing dialogues? Next slide. 
It's not. It's actually, for first, conversation is an exchange of language between two or more participants taking turns toward a goal. In chatbots now, it's either um, learning, it's either troubleshooting, so some kind of transaction, or sometimes you can have a chatbot with, um, it's just for fun, so social or building relationships. And it's in, in really, it's the currency with which humans also build relationships. So if we go to the next slide, conversation design then refers to the, the concepts and strategies of designing those interaction flows and strategizing the, the language to build that conversation between a user and a system. And there's a quote by uh, Kathy Pearl, um, if we go to the next slide. Um, conversation design basically is about teaching computers to communicate with humans and talk like humans and making experiences easy, intuitive. And the goal is of course, to reduce friction and frustration. So basically, um, next slide please. Conversation design is language strategy. Uh, oh, sorry, there's an animation here. Uh, Kelly, who's, yeah, can you go three more times? So um, uh, language strategy. Like how many messages in a row should a bot send before it gets overwhelming? You wanna think about turn-taking or interaction design. Um, when and how should we surface escalation in a dialogue flow? Then you have like the information architecture uh, and the conversation flows. And then how to build an experience that won't alienate folks of diverse backgrounds and different dialects. You want um, to include diverse intent training data and also um, diversity in the teams to consider uh, and be mindful of those things and catch things that other people otherwise wouldn't. And of course, persona building, right? And so now that that's the definition of conversation design, we're gonna go in briefly into the different types of chatbots there are. So now um, before conversation design tools have basically evolved, it used to be just decision tree. Now we have um, intent-based and generative AI. And the difference between this is decision trees are very, uh, very rigid. Is it this, yes or no, go down this path. But intent-based, when we, we mean by intent-based, we can take um, a phrase like, where's my order? If we know that a customer said that phrase, we can train certain um, uh, utterances to go to exactly just where is my order. And it could trigger at any moment. It doesn't have to go through a decision tree. And then generative AI, now we don't even have to design that intent sometimes. We just have to connect the system to a help center. And then now you're talking to your help center, which means your help center documents need to be um, precise and consistent. Otherwise, the what the machine will spit out will be inconsistent. And I'm gonna hand it over to Austin now to talk about how to stand up a team. Great, so yeah, now that we have that introduction to kind of what conversation design is and in the industry here, let's talk a little bit about how to stand up a, a team for this because it is a new industry that is relatively new and, and constantly changing. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. I just wanna set the stage first with our team's mission here at Zendesk. So our team here is part of the digital experience team within customer experience at Zendesk. So we have the overall goal to provide our customers with experiences that help them learn and understand our offerings in practical ways. So what that means is we're responsible for providing answers, solutions, knowledge that has been built by our teams. Sometimes that knowledge is built by my team itself, so like the chatbot automation team. And sometimes that knowledge is actually crafted by other teams like our product docs team, our knowledge base team, marketing, um, et cetera. So there's a lot of different places our content lives, but ultimately we're the ones that are responsible for delivering this content to our customers through our chatbot, through our automation and our different digital experiences. So we produce and manage these assets to help users learn or solve problems about our product. And the overall goal is to reduce friction through these technologies and automations that we own. We really wanna make it really easy for our customers to get the information they need right at their fingertips, right when they need it. Now, how does this relate to Zendesk business goals? Um, there's a couple key points there that are on the slide. 
um, reducing inbound contacts. So that saves time for our ticket bearing teams, our customer facing teams, and allows them to really focus on interactions that actually do need the human to human support. I think that's a key thing to call out here because you need to be intentional that you're not trying to just deflect your customers and you know, put a chatbot out there to prevent them from talking to a human. That's not our goal here. Our goal here is to remove the ones that can be solved by a chatbot, but to have intentional conversations human to human for the ones that do need it. And by removing those conversations that don't need it, we're able to spend more time on the ones that do. So that's a big uh, goal that we have and, and something we really take at heart for our team um, as a principal. The next is, you know, enabling efficiency gains through operations with automation. Um, that's pretty straightforward. And then most importantly, I would say is delighting our customers and providing a positive customer experience. We're very focused on my team about the customer experience. We want our customers to really trust our bot, to trust our automations. And when we're able to provide faster time to value through our self-service tools and, you know, allow them to see that the content we're offering is proactive and helpful for them, we build that trust. And in the end, that means they're going to be more likely to actually use our self-service tools because they have that trust. Um, so if you could hop to the next slide, please. So overall skills, um, you know, to build this team, that's a lot of different goals there that we have. Uh, and, you know, I'll be honest right there that there's no one person that's going to have all the the necessary skills to, to produce that perfectly. Um, so, Overall, it requires a lot of over, overlapping skill sets to build a team that accomplishes those goals. Um, the diagram here summarizes roughly three key areas that I'd say are really important for building out a team from the ground up. And we really looked at these a few years ago when we first built out the team. Um, so the important part um, of why I chose to use a diagram to visualize this is that the overlap overlapping in skill sets is just really important and to not have siloed approaches. Uh, it may seem really difficult to find people that have these overlaps, but trust me, there's people out there that are willing to learn them and are willing to you know, find a way to make and, and really grow themselves into this kind of overlapping Venn diagram here. Um, so let's start at the top of the, the diagram right now. The first part I'd say is content writing. So Marlinda talked about conversation design. It's pretty obvious that you need to have someone that can write uh, to build a bot because you're sending messages and you're sending messages that need to conform to your style guide, to your, you know, your marketing, all that kind of stuff. Um, great. But the important part here is to remember that's a different style of writing. You're not writing paragraphs of text like you would for a knowledge base article or for a website. You have a really limited amount of real estate that you're working in. So that's why conversational context is really important here. It's so like Marlinda mentioned, it's it's you know, crafting it to have a conversation, not just provide information. So you're going back and forth with the customer here. And that's why it's a, it's a very different type of, of content writing than maybe some people are used to. Now, the next part, um, individuals to put themselves in the shoes of our customers is really important. And that's that CX experience, the purple part of the graph there. Um, people that may have been a customer previously or people that have worked with your customers are really good fit and have a natural understanding of what a good customer experience might look like. So crafting a conversational experience that we have found is, you know, much easier and just natural for people that have that customer experience mindset and are really, you know, out there thinking of our customer first and, and how the customer is going to perceive the interaction. Now, the final area is technical skills. This fits in because when you're writing and building the customer experience, you need to understand what's possible for your tech stack. So in this case, like I mentioned earlier, again, you're not just writing paragraphs of text. The way bots behave and automations behave, there's a lot of technology involved. And because there's a lot of technology involved, when you're building these flows, having the understanding of what technology is actually available to you is really important. If you don't understand what data is available to you, um, you know, what type of ways you can display the content in your widget or whatever mechanism you're using, it's going to really limit you and cut you off at the possibilities you have for providing that content. So having a technical skill set where you're willing to roll up your sleeves and get in there and understand, not saying you need to be someone that builds the technology, you know, there's engineers for that, but to at least understand and play around with the tool and understand its limitations is a real key driver that we have found that you need to have on the team because that 
opens up a lot more to what you can do with the way you're delivering the content there. So overall, these three really important overlaps here. Um, I would kind of summarize these are kind of the three buckets and, and we'll dive into them a little bit more here next. Um, so next slide, please. So skills to have on your team. Um, the first one I'll just mention is the, you know, we mentioned a few of these on that last slide, but uh, let's talk about the ones maybe we didn't dive into there. Uh, previous customer support experience is one that I would just want to call out here as an important one. On my team, I've actually hired quite a few people from our customer support team to work as a bot builder for my team. Uh, why we did that is that you naturally, when you're hiring someone from that position, they have the experience with customers. So they know how to talk to our customers already. And you think about it, a bot, well, you don't want it to emulate a human per se. You want it to be clear that it's a bot. You're having a conversation like an agent would with the customer. So they already know how to talk to your customers. They also have the content skills. So they already know your product or whatever you know, you're supporting. So naturally they're not having to learn, you know, all the ins and outs of the product. And in, in Zendesk case, software, you know, it's a very complex product. So having that, that base is, is really important for that. Um, so we've we've hired a few of those. Um, that's definitely been an area. But again, you can't just hire one skill set. So it's important to make sure you're you're being diverse in your hiring because you do need people with the conversation design experience. You need people with the content experience. Um, so that's that's important. The next one I'll mention is project management and data analysis. Um, the way our team is structured is that we have a lot of external stakeholders that we work with. So when we're building bot flows, you know, we're building for the sales team or the go-to-market team. We're building for our marketing team. We're building for the support team. Um, so we have to work with a lot of different stakeholders that do this. And having stakeholder and project management experience is important because getting their opinion, holding them to, you know, milestones and things like that is good. That's a skill you can definitely teach people. Um, so not something that I necessarily, you know, need to have a ton of requirements, but I'm looking for people that would be willing to learn that when I'm looking at building out a team. Um, the other part of it is going to be process maps. When you're building your bot flows at first, they're really going to be glorified flow charts. Um, so Marlinda showed on a previous slide, kind of those decision trees. That's kind of how you start with the bot flow, honestly, in a lot of cases. You're building it in like a Lucid chart or a Figma, and you're needing to have that skill set of mapping things out like that without having the text there necessarily, because the text comes later in the process. But having that skill set to really visualize the full end-to-end -end customer experience, with which is in that bottom right corner box, user experience design, that's a really key driver that you need to think of beyond the ability to just write the content. Um, so definitely something I would call out there. And then the last one um, I'll just mention is the willingness to learn new tools and experiment. I can't overemphasize this one um, in the chatbot AI and automation space. It is constantly changing and evolving. So a lot of you are probably already aware of that, but every week it's like something new comes out. So flexibility here, again, can't be overstated. Uh, someone that's willing to just roll up their sleeves, try out new technology, experiment with it, do A-B tests, uh, you know, dive into documentation. Really, really important because in, you know, a couple of months from now, who knows what the next thing is going to be. And, you know, when we're hiring for these roles, we can't anticipate that it's always going to be the same, that it's going to be the standard bot. You know, we're going to have more generative AI in there. We're going to have a lot of things. So, um, flexibility is definitely something that I think is a really good skill set to have in this space because your your job is probably going to be changing as you continue to go on here. And then I already mentioned the technical part. Um, sorry, I, I did one other thing I wanted to mention um, before I go to the next slide. Um, but you know, having that interest and in being able to speak engineer, I say that in quotes, uh, is something that is really unique. And I would say if you can find someone that can do that. Uh, you'll go a long ways in this space because chances are you're going to be working with engineering teams or your IT team here to get the systems off the ground and configured the way you want them. And by having the ability to translate between your stakeholders who don't have that technical knowledge, maybe other team members that don't have that technolo technological knowledge, and then the engineering teams, um, being able to translate that is something that I would say is pretty paramount here. So how you can structure a team. There's basically two ways that I've seen in the industry that you can structure a chatbot or an automation team. 
there's the way you can do it, which I would call separate functions. So in a separate function setup, um, that's pretty much where you would have different team members owning different components of the design process. So for example, um, conversation design, so actually writing the prompts, building the flow chart, that would be one individual's responsibility. So at that point, they are owning the actual text of the conversation, and they're probably building it, like I said, a Lucid chart or a Figma, something like that. They're putting it on the paper. Now, when they're done with writing out the replies and the actual bot flow functions, they're going to hand it over to a bot builder. And that might be someone that you know is more technical and, and works actually in the tool. So depending, and sometimes teams take this approach with the separate functions because of the tool that they're using. The tool might be super technical and not you know, it doesn't have a nice web GUI or, you know, ways for people to, to build easily. They'll hand it off and someone else will actually input and build out the flows. Um, and then the final phase of that would be that they'd hand it off to a third person who actually owns the AI model and does like the expression training and the management to make sure the confusion between intents and things like that are handled correctly. So there you kind of have three different components in a separate functions team and three people are independently working on different parts of a bot flow to get it off the ground. Now, the other way to do this is a hybrid function. And I'll be transparent. We use the hybrid function here on my team at Zendesk. So this is where each individual, each individual in the team works end to end on the experience. So you're not handing it off necessarily between people. The person that writes the flows and builds out the flow chart is actually the one also building it in the tool. So my team, like Marlinda, for example, she will build out the flow, the, the text and everything, and also build it in our actual bot. She'll also do the expression training. And we're lucky to have a, a tool that is very user-friendly where it doesn't require a lot of technical knowledge or any code. Um, so we're able to take that approach where individuals own the end-to-end -end process. Now, the other part I mentioned about that is you can't just expect everyone to be an expert in every part of the process either. So we do have work stream leads, um, but generally everyone on my team can build end-to-end. -end, and then we built, we bring in work stream leads if you have a more complex, maybe flow you need some technical help on or something like that. But generally the hybrid function is where everyone has a basic understanding. You're not siloing the different uh, functions of the bot building process. So in my opinion, the hybrid approach is the future of bots and automation teams. And there's a few reasons why I feel this way. Uh, we've been very successful in this approach of taking the hybrid approach. We've you know, have been able to deliver a significant amount of automations, a significant amount of bot flows in a very reasonable amount of time. The reason I think this is really the future is that middle point here on the slide. And that's that generative AI is gaining traction. As you get more and more generative AI in this space, there's going to be less of a need for writing the actual bot flows and those decision trees. So like Marlinda showed, you know, it's becoming more of like the model is actually sending out the text. You're plugging in information and the model is then generating the actual text. So that means there's not as much of a need necessarily in some cases where you need to do like the writing and the actual flowchart building. You know, you can kind of just train the AI stuff and it's going to spit out the information depending on the parameters that you enter in. So the reason I think that it's important to have this hybrid approach is just to enable your team to be prepared for the future. You know, everyone being able to do the technical side of it and the writing side of it is important because those facets are going to change of, you know, how much writing we're doing versus how much AI model and analysis we're doing. Um, I see that shifting quite a bit in the, you know, the near future. So that's kind of the main reason I think this hybrid approach is the other part that I would call out that really has shown through our team is that needing the ability to know what your tool can do. If you're only writing the content and building it in like a flowchart tool, you're not actually understanding as much as you could the full capabilities of your tool. Um, I mean, you're probably well versed in it, but having that full knowledge yourself of being like, I know exactly what my tool can do or what my limitations of my tool are helps you when you're building that flow and building that flow chart because you know what you can and can't do. If you don't know what you can and can't do, chances are you might not be using your tool to its full potential, or you might be proposing things that just aren't possible and that's going to delay your projects. So that's really why we started the hybrid approach, honestly, at Zendesk was that we wanted to have that 
full knowledge so that people that are are building are able to to use all the features we have at our disposal. And then the last part I'd put on the slide is just around automation delights customers. And the more automation you can do, so that's resolving things end to end for them. Um, and the reason I think the hybrid approach is important for that is the automation side requires a lot of interaction between the writing, the technical teams, the data, all those different components. And again, having that understanding of all the different parts of your tech stack really paramount here to make automation successful. And as I mentioned earlier, just a successful implementation of the hybrid approach does utilize work streams. You can't expect everybody to be an expert in everything. Um, I have no expectation of that for my team members. And here's a couple example of work streams where we do like have that set up. So we have a tech lead. So someone that's our more technical person on the team. We have our product content lead, and then we have our style guide lead. So for example, Marlinda is our style guide lead. So she controls and you know maintains our style guide. If people who are building have a question about, so like maybe our tech lead has a question, he's building an intent and doesn't know the right phrasing for something we want to say, he would go to Marlinda for advice in that point. However, he would still actually own the full end-to-end -end experience that he's building. Um, same with the product content. Our product content is the one staying with her ear to the ground on Zendesk changes to make sure, you know, we're getting the latest information, working with our knowledge base team. So having the leads helps a lot where people don't feel overwhelmed because they always have somebody that they can go to if they need additional information or assistance in that area. And now we'll hand it back to Marlinda to talk a little bit about bot personas. Yes. So um, one of the first things you want to do is create a persona for your chat bot. And I want to say that more and more often now, sometimes a chat bot is, your, is the first experience a customer has with your brand. So next slide. Um, and so having a consistent persona then improves the customer experience because you can um, you want to make sure that it doesn't sound too robotic. You want to your customers to feel the conversation to feel um, human enough, but not too robotic that it takes too much attention from the actual flow that the customer is going through. And like I said, it um, having that consistent brand identity just um, helps helps. Uh, your customer feel like they're talking to, to your brand. Um, and also it saves uh, admins and agents a lot of hours. I also wanna say that it also saves us a lot of time on the bot building side because we're not trying to figure out who should say what, especially when you have a lot of team uh, people on your team working on different areas. And let's say someone um, takes time off, or let's say there is a part of a different part of your org who's like, we want this kind of a chat bot flow for this, um, for finance or sales. And so they start um, building something, but they're not too familiar with um, you, your, your dialogue. So you want to have that persona that then can help anchor all the teams and then un understand, oh, this is a helpful chat bot. It's a friendly chat bot. It says this in these situations, and it makes it easier to scale. And um, next slide, please. So um, some, some things to consider when you uh, want to create a chatbot persona is obviously you want to think about your audience um, and you want to understand how they might phrase certain things. Things I learned at Zendesk um, for customer support and customer service is um, looking at the data, I was, uh, it's very often that I see a customer phrase something that I never would have thought to, to say it that way. So understanding your audience, um, considering your brand values. And also, I also had to talk to the, the content team here because there are a lot of um, overlap and things that I kind of wanted to include in the chatbot voice that Zendesk already has in their brand guidelines. Um, a name and identity. I think it's, imp I've seen many chatbots where they kind of just go in like, hey, I can help you with this, um, but they don't ever refer to it as anything. So sometimes I feel like, well, how do I know like who I'm talking to and and who is it sometimes when when the chatbot starts getting into the pronouns. 
And all of this um, then creates a unique voice and you can develop personalized interactions with your customers having that persona guideline. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Austin now to talk about how to choose a tool. Great, so yeah, we can go to the next slide here. So there is a lot of chatbot tools and automation tools out there. And I just wanted to share briefly, we won't go into a ton of detail here today. Uh, this could actually be its own talk itself about tool evaluation and, and how to choose one for your, your business. But I wanted to share just this slide here, which was a framework that we used a few years ago when we chose a chatbot tool for, um, for our business. Uh, we divided it in four different kind of key areas that we looked for when we were doing the tool evaluation. So we looked at the functional and usability of a tool. We looked at the technical capabilities, the strategic fit, and the total cost of ownership. So we evaluated all the vendors that we looked at from this, uh, you know, this lens. So under like the functional and usability, which accounted for about 30% of the score when we scored our vendors um, at the procurement level, we were looking at, you know, how well does the solution meet the functional needs we have now and then into the future. So we really had to take a, you know, a step back and look at like, you know, what's our future plan for this bot? We obviously had a go live plan, but we want this technology that we're implementing to be for the long term. Uh, a chat bot or an automation tool is not something you really can just rip and replace. You know, if we were to rip and replace our our tool today, it would be a significant amount of of rebuild and rework that we would have to do. And um, we really want to account for that so that you're not in a few years, you know, scrapping what you did to move to something that maybe has more features that you didn't anticipate. So really think about that in advance. I think that's a really, you know, the scalability is kind of the next point on there, the same thing. Uh, you know, having that ability for a tool that can meet all of your future demands. I mean, you're never going to be able to expect everything, but, you know, you don't want to be picking something that obviously is, you know, right at your limits at the moment, because chances are, as your business evolves, you're going to have more and more requirements. Um, an intuitive user experience is really important. Um, like I said, we couldn't do the hybrid approach unless we had the intuitive uh, UI that our tool works in. Uh, it's a very low to no code you know, implementation of it. And a lot of these tools are becoming that way. There's a lot of them popping up everywhere. Um, the traditional chatbots like five plus years ago required usually a developer to do a lot of that work. And that's why that you know separate functional team that I mentioned was a thing back then. Um, so thinking about that, you know, what's your approach there? Do you want to have maybe a more lean team that can do everything or do you have IT resources and things like that to, you know, be able to help you um, from the UI perspective? So we really looked for an intuitive UI. And then the, the last one there is performance. Obviously, you want to make sure that they have good uptime measurements. Uh, your customers are going to be using your chatbot probably in their time of need. So having that performance is, you know, a key a driver to keep the customer trust up. You know, you want to meet them in a good place when they're in a bad place. Um, so we accounted that for about 30%. Now on the right side there, the other 30% was the technical capabilities. So integrations, uh, this is, I would say we'd actually, if we did this today, we'd probably adjust this to be even more than 30%. We'd probably shave something off somewhere else because in the world where everything's getting more data-driven and automation-driven, we, the APIs and things like that are really the key to making all that happen. It's the magic behind the scenes. If you can't do APIs, you can't reach your systems that you need to get that real-time data in or to write to systems. Um, like we actually have some automations that will, the bot will change things in people's accounts for them. Uh, you're kind of dead in the water if it can't do that. And that's really the future of bots is people are expecting a lot more from their bot to to do things for them. You know, they don't want to just have instructions. They want it to actually like complete it for them. So that's really important. Uh, support complex intents. We have a lot of really custom business logic, like that routing point that's next that we had to be able to build, you know, significant flow charts with many, many branches and to link things together and, and whatnot. So I'd recommend when you're doing a tool evaluation, really sit down and maybe map out some of your most complex flows before you pick a tool and then see if that tool can meet the needs to build that flow. That's kind of my recommendation there for that part. And then the last part there is driving, um, you know, trend analysis reporting is important. Um, I'd say that that's, you know, definitely an area where a lot of tools are developing quickly. Uh, 
there hasn't traditionally been a ton of reporting capabilities in a lot of these bot tools, but we're starting to see people invest in that area. So that's something that, um, you know, is going there. Strategic fit, uh, you know, this kind of depends on your business. Uh, you know, if you're a larger enterprise organization, it's probably more important to look at the, you know, account management things. What kind of success teams are they giving you? Um, does their product roadmap and vision align to you? Uh, we looked at all of that and, um, you know, vendors that are willing to partner with you in that sense is obviously a, a huge benefit and and stuff. But we, we you know, put that only at 15%. Um, obviously the technical capabilities and things are a little bit more important in that case. And then uh, the last quadrant over there is the total cost of ownership. You, you know, your finance partners and, and all those people will in procurement will appreciate, uh, you know, this section is, you know, looking at how the licensing works, you know, does it mean just your team can go in there or is it going to cost you if like you need to bring in it or other stakeholders to, to review intents and stuff before they go live um, what's the implementation cost and and time to implementation is important. You know, do you need to get this out now? And maybe they're going to say, oh, no, our tool typically has the, you know, eight to 12 month implementation time. Um, so looking at that. And then the last thing we did was, you know, we looked actually at our top 15 use cases where we wanted to do self-service or have questions answered by the bot um, within the first six months and looking at like, what was the amount of time and, and cost it would take for us to build those first 15 interactions. Um, so we, that's kind of how we have been, we evaluated that. So this is just kind of a simple framework. I just want to share um, with everyone in case you are evaluating a tool. Uh, every business is going to be a little bit different, but this is kind of a nice starting point to, to look at, you know, how you could evaluate different tools and the things to look for out there. And then the last topic I just wanted to touch on today was briefly on maintenance and continuous improvement. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I have a quote here. Um, to improve is to change, to change, to be perfect is to change often. Now, I want to call out nothing's ever going to be perfect, um, especially when it comes to this. But the point of this quote is that in this space, you're never done. Uh, a lot of people treat bot projects as a, like, one-time project. Like, oh, we're going to build a bot and then we're done. That is not the case here. Um, it's very similar to like a knowledge base where the content is, it's living. It's always changing. It's always adjusting. So if you're not making changes um, and you're not continuously updating your bot or your automations, they're going to become obsolete and they're not going to be delighting your customers. You're going to have problems with it. You're going to have issues with the, re you know, the relevancy of the content. Um, so that's kind of the, the point of the quote there. We can hop to the next slide quick. Um, so again, you know, why is it important with the maintenance side? It, it's just something I like to stress because I just see so many teams treat these like projects, especially where they might hire a contractor and then the contractor ends and the bot kind of becomes, you know, unowned at that point. Um, there's really just no no point in in doing that because your bot's going to become obsolete. Your customers are going to lose trust in it. The technology is going to change um, very quickly. You know, especially with this automation and AI stuff. If you don't have someone implementing, you know, generative AI into your chatbot right now um, for certain flows and things like that, your your bot's going to not be you know at par with what everyone else has out there. Um, and then the last thing is learning from conversation reviews. So my team actually is part of our maintenance and continuous improvement initiatives. We review conversations continuously in ZBot, which is our bot. Um, so we actually go through the logs and look at how customers are interacting with them, the ones that do create tickets and the ones that don't create tickets. Um, so we're reading through there. We're, you know, Marlon mentioned she had a lot of learnings for how customers say things to it. That's where we really get that information. So if you're not doing continuous review of your conversations, you're not getting that uh, that pulse check on, you know, how are your customers responding? What are they asking? Um, things like that. So I, I really recommend, you know, staffing and and having at least some, you know, time allocated towards reviewing and, and doing all that maintenance to update your content based on what you're seeing um, and flows and routing because it, it just is not, I don't think we've ever had anything stay stagnant in our bot for very long. It's, it's really something that is always living and breathing and, and needs further development, um, not because it's wrong, but just because of customer expectations change and the business expectations change as well. So really would encourage people to, to make sure they're looking at the maintenance side. Next slide. And then just a, a quick diagram kind of of what, you know, I just talked about there is, you know, analyzing 
utterances and things through conversation reviews, kind of where you start, you then can classify them into the intents, do the whole conversation design process, prototype, build, test, you know, and then you see the line after shipping goes back. So it's a continuous circle of of always looking at things and and making sure you're you're staying fresh on your content. I I'd compare it very similar to how our knowledge base team works. They're always reviewing the articles for relevancy and you know making updates and things like that. So with that, that's the the content we had for this morning here. Um, would now be happy to have some discussion, and Marlinda and I can definitely answer any questions or comments people have. There was one question in the chat about the org structure and the relationship between your team and services or support, where where you live in Zendesk. Yeah, so we're part of the customer experience team, which is like our all of our customer front-facing teams live. So like our success managers, our customer support team, um, we directly sit in the operations department of that. So um, we like align with like our workforce management team, our continuous improvement team, um, our knowledge base team is also reports to my director. Uh, so we we sit in that area. We do not have our own engineering team or IT team um, dedicated just to like the bot per se. So we have a teams that we work with and have dedicated resourcing to help us. Um, so we we are not in IT. I think that's somewhere that you'll see some bot teams live as might be in that, that IT org. Uh, we do not live there. We actually live on the customer experience side. And I'm, you know, there, there's definitely pluses and minuses to both of those situations. I don't think there's a perfect place for any one bot team to live. Um, I'm really glad we live in where we do just for the sense of the customer side, that it's very customer oriented. Um, well, I love more IT support, of course. Um, you know, that's always something that we want more engineers. We want more IT help um, to make, you know, automations and things like that. But generally, I think yeah, sitting in a customer experience org and being customer experience focused is definitely a good way to approach your bot. Hopefully that helps answer the question. Yeah, thank you. Um. The other sort of thing happening in the chat is the is the idea of are you telling people when they're engaging with a, a bot versus letting people guess? Yeah, we definitely do. Um, maybe Merlinda, if you want to add some commentary, I know you've had some opinions on that over over your years of experience. There's a lot of talk about um, letting people know ethically. It's an ethic issue to let people know that you are talking to a chat bot. And actually California has it because California is special. California actually has a law that states you have to say it is a chat bot. So if you have a chat bot that anybody in California can access, it must have that. Otherwise you'll face legal issues if you're caught. <laughs> So yeah, like we at Zendesk, we don't pretend it's a human at all. Like I know sometimes you go to a website and it says like you're talking with Angela and it's like a bot named Angela. Like we call ours, ours a Z-bot and it has a, you know, an avatar that is a, a face of a bot. So we're very transparent with that. And I'm glad we take that approach. I think, you know, Merlinda agrees with me on that. Our, our whole team does that. We don't try to hide it at all. And, and like she said, ethically, it is like something that is being discussed. I, I think in, in Europe, it's a big topic as well. Um, same with California. So definitely important to make sure you're you're calling that out. Uh, Vicky asks if there is a recommendation for how many questions the bot asks before it pivots to a live person. They are in the process of building a new bot and don't want users to be annoyed by too many questions. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, we did a lot of A-B testing with that and and continue to, you know, how much pushback should we do? How much should we not uh, the thing that we found, uh, so the I guess let me start with the, kind of the goal we had, and I'll let Marlinda chime in on kind of her thoughts on the number of questions because she's played with some of these A-B tests and stuff we did. But we really were trying to at least just get a grasp of what the customer was asking about from our, our bot. Like we originally, the way we had our welcome message set up originally, it said, you know, like, hi, I'm Zbot, how can I help? And people just say agent. And we wanted to at least you know, even if we do need to get them to an agent right away, which is not a problem, we wanted to know what agent to get them to, because that, you know, there's still a human time savings effort that we don't have to manually triage our tickets if the bot can identify the topic and send it to the right, you know, group that we have on our different support teams. So that was kind of our goal in mind. It wasn't necessarily to like 
you know, prevent people from talking to an agent. It was like, we just want to help automate this and actually help get you to the right place. Um, so we tried a few different things and maybe Marlinda, if you want to add in kind of your thoughts on like the number of questions that kind of jives well. Yeah, I'm thinking about this and um, sometimes I want to say first, it depends on the type of flow that you're trying to create. Like if you're gathering information, I wouldn't be too angry if it was just a couple, though maybe if it's more than four or five, maybe it's better to send them to a form. Like what's your name? What's your last name? You know, all that, that might be too much in a chat bot. Um, when it comes to, let's say, trying to understand if the reason why they're at, the bot has to ask so many questions is because it didn't understand the person. And so it's like, do you need this? What do you need help with? Uh, yeah, I would, the A-B testing that we did um, that Austin mentioned has, has really helped in understanding like, okay, at this point, this is the threshold. We should send them, and this is the severity of the issue, send them straight to an, an agent. If it's something yeah. you have an intent for, um, we try to route it like if, if and especially if what they said agent first, like, okay, maybe this will help <laughs> and, and then go to an agent. Yeah. We generally try to get like one self-service piece of content in front of them. And if it doesn't, you know, answer the question, then we, we do an agent. I think Marlinda brought up a really good point about forms that I would echo is that if you're asking more than like two questions, a form is really helpful. And I don't know what tool you're using, but for us, we can actually have forms within our bot flows. So we can have a form displayed to the customer where we can ask multiple questions at once. And that was a, a big learning lesson we had actually when we first launched our bot is during our handoff process, we ask a few different pieces of information, like which product are you talking about? What's the business impact? You know, it got a few different questions there. And people were kind of getting annoyed because we'd ask them one by one. So it'd be like, okay, what is the product area? They'd select a button. Now, what is the business impact? They select a button and they would keep going. And people are like, gosh, how many questions do I have to answer before they're going to let me talk to a human? And so what we implemented was we have a form now at that point where it just asks all the questions right there at once. So they can see right there that there's four questions they have to answer. And the transparency there, I think, makes people much more willing to interact and it just reduces that friction there. We, we've had a lot of positive feedback about that change we made. We made that pretty quick after we launched. So if you can implement a form for those kind of cases um, and some of our intents, we have forms too, like if we're collecting info, really recommend that as an approach compared to asking, you know, three, four or five questions in a row. That's kind of, I'd say that three to five range is really where people start to get frustrated. I can imagine a scenario in which putting the form in the flow in the right location is also really important, right? If I'm swinging by just to get a quick answer and you want to know everything about my product, even just to start the chat, I am leaving your site and going to Google the end. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, Alex is asking about, um, Alex says, our current bot solution allows for regular topic workflows. It feels disjointed in a way that it cannot grab information from our KCS KB self-service resolutions to conversationalize in line in the chat, but instead it directs the customer to an article. Do you see this as a big stumbling block when presenting content via bot? Yeah, so we've recently moved, and this is where the generative AI, I think, is really powerful. Um, we previously had a similar workflow where uh, if we didn't have an intent matched for like where we had a pre-built flow for something, uh, we would fail over to do an article search in our help center, in our widget. So it would search whatever the customer said and then reply back with the top two articles that are recommended. And yeah, it kind of felt a little disjointed and you know, a lot of effort for the customer there to click on the link and then to read the article and, you know, go to a new tab, all that kind of stuff. This is where the GPT and like generative AI functionality has really come into play. So we brought it in and we're, we just finished an AB test on this where we, instead of um, offering those articles, we have our help center ingested into a generative AI tool. So all content in our help center is brought into this generative AI tool. So it's safe from a perspective of hallucinations and stuff. It's just pulling from that. It's not GPT of the entire internet, which I really don't recommend implementing in your bot. Um, so we uh, we have that. And so if we don't have an intent for it, it fails over and does a GPT generative AI response based on articles. So it actually 
So if you say like, how do I create this report? It's going to go into our knowledge base search it and it responds back with a paragraph or two. And then it also cites the article that it took that information from. And another ethical thing, I know we talked about, you know, being transparent, that's a bot. We're telling people at that point that this is a AI generated response. So we're saying this was generated with AI. Here's what we came up with. And here's the source. Um, so that's a much more clean way uh, for people to get that content and not have to go to another tab or, or you know other places to view it while still utilizing all of that information you have in your knowledge base and not having to rework it or bring it you know into another place and rewrite it. Uh, we've seen significant uh, increase. I see my uh, my boss Maddie's on here and has some a comment on it. It looks like, but uh, we've seen a significant increase in the amount of resolutions from that compared to the article clicks. Maddie, oh, you that's interesting. interesting. I I was gonna just recommend you read my mind. I was gonna recommend to you that if you if you were open to sharing, I, I know Austin shared the team has been A B testing these two user experiences against each other, and when he says um a significant improvement in like self resolution, I it, it is not uh, an insignificant amount, and so I don't know if you're comfortable sharing Austin, but uh, we're still in the midst of our test is why why we're being cagey here, but. Um, if you want to share, I think this group might be interested to hear it. So, yeah, we're seeing about a ten percent increase um in resolution of those compared to the ones that were just article clicks, which for us is a huge number of of tickets, um, given our volume. So, and we have only implemented it, like I said, at fifty percent of English only. So we haven't even brought it into our non English. So, like ten percent increase of our entire volume, um, resolution wise is is really really impactful. So. Highly recommend that if you have a tool to try that. Um, but it's really important with all that generative stuff to be safe about it and to not, you know, have ways to to create hallucinations. And I think we have time for this, maybe this last question here, which is from Judy, how does the KCS methodology influence your bot design? Yeah, I think we take you know a similar approach to uh, our knowledge base team. You know, uses KCS a lot, and um, you know we are trying to implement that more into the bot world, um, in the sense that like we want our customer support teams and our knowledge uh, folks that you know read the bot interactions and get tickets and get feedback on it to provide us with feedback and to be able to contribute to our our bot. Um, one thing we just tried and. Part of it's a little bit different. It's like our knowledge base tool. We have a really nice way for people to suggest articles, to you know, changes and things like that. The bot's a little bit harder because of the way the tools are set up. Like, our we we have to limit access for who can actually go into our our bot building tool and and, and stuff like that. So we've created processes where people can submit feedback to us and and do that. And it's kind of that continuous improvement you know idea there. Um, but we're starting to get into the idea of like where our customer support you know, looks at those transcripts that they get from the bot when they get a ticket and can apply um, a macro on the ticket that notifies my team for review um, so that we're not quite, you know, at the level of KCS at a knowledge base because of some of those limitations, but we're trying our best to really, you know, have that, that cycle of um, knowledge sharing going on. Mm -hmm. I, um, Perhaps in conclusion, I can just tell you a, a couple things that I heard that feels like um, you are implementing in an environment that that has sort of a KCS maybe foundation or some KCS influence, which is the idea that it's a system, right? The idea that when, what you're building in terms of a conversation and a, and a bot interaction really is a system that needs tending. Um, the idea of how important customer um uh, experience is in this process, right? So, which really is another way of gathering context and talking about the context of the the user who's asking the question. Um, and then we saw we saw a double loop happening, right? I think it was in one of your one of your last slides in terms of the continuous improvement um, piece. Mm -hmm. That all feels very very connected to to a KCS environment. And I see Maddie raising her hand. My only addition is I would just say that um, in a, uh, plus everything you just said and everything Austin said, but as our knowledge team does um, domain analysis, 
we treat our bot experience like one of our products, which means that we also um, are looking for opportunities in the, KD, the KDA process for um, continuous improvement informed by what we're seeing in tickets and utilization of content in reuse. Um, so that's all, um, it's, another, it's another double loop that sort of lives on top of all of that too, so. We love loops, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> well, perfect. Um, thank you so much, Austin and Marlinda. This was so informative. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experience around these things. Thanks everybody for being here with us. Um, we will publish this recording with a little blog post um, that will be out within the next day or two. Um, and we hope to see you at another event real soon. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.